Let's welcome in our next guest, Kenneth Andre, founder and CEO at Old Bridge Capital Management. Kenneth, it's uh, really been a while and uh, you've had a change of role as well. Uh, so can you just tell us about uh, the new role? What does Old Bridge, uh, Old Bridge Capital Management uh, do? Uh, well, uh, we've just got a license to, uh, uh, to start a portfolio management service in, in India. So this will be largely for domestic clients. Um, I take on from, uh, from my last assignments, uh, which has been 15 years of fund management experience and also 25 years of uh, work ex in the entire capital markets. So looking forward to put up a domestic, uh, a small domestic product uh, over the next couple of months and looking to get back to investing all over again. Right. Uh, so as of now, no investments. We are in the process of making investments. Yeah, it's, it's a relatively new uh, organization, um, and uh, we hope we we're looking to build it forward into the next couple of uh, couple of years, and starting 2016. Right. Uh, so you know, let's talk about markets uh, and what is the feel that you get. So if I would have asked you in the month of Jan and Feb, you are one person who would look at the valuations, the growth going ahead. What is expected? You know, you're you're very pass. Uh, you know, you're a you're largely a very conservative investor. So at this level, say if one had to invest or buy into equities here into Indian markets, the returns would be very very back ended. Uh, well, a lot of uh, a lot of stock prices are reflecting uh, a reasonable amount of optimism, but I don't think that's an India problem really. It's uh, it's something that's happening across the asset market across the world. And uh, that where the, that's where the problem really arises. So locally, uh, we, have, we definitely have our challenges, but in terms of balance sheet sizes, both with the government, corporate India, and uh, consumers in India, I think it's much more manageable than what the rest of the world is. Uh, second is, uh, I think we've got our policies right in place right now, and a lot of inefficiencies are coming out of the system and will contribute to growth over the near term also. So I'm... I'm I'm a little uh, cautious on, on where valuations in the market stand at this point in time. But even in the medium term, I think uh, we should be quite okay uh, as, uh, as uh, equity investors in India. Right. Uh, say if we would look at the earnings so far that we've got, you know, generally you would expect the companies that deliver earlier should deliver good growth. But uh, Indescent was just okay. Uh, you know, Infosys, TCS, HUL was also not that uh, great. Expectations from Wipro are particularly weak. So do you think the 15-16% number that the street is going in with for this year may see a revision after the Q1, which may not be liked by the markets? I'm not too sure if the street is going in with 15-16% to 16 because that's the kind of growth you haven't seen for the last four or five years. So I don't think the ship can uh, turn itself so soon and not such a large, uh, and, and, and with not such a large degree. I'd be more happy if earnings were moderated. Look, we've got a three-year flat kind of a structure in terms of corporate earnings. Uh, and rather than just looking at one part of the entire equation, which is corporate earnings, I essentially look to see how well India is getting restructured on the balance sheet side of it all. And uh, on the balance sheet side, I think the this year, 2016-17, and a large part of 2016 also, you've seen companies not wanting to invest, uh, wanting to generate cash flows and pay down significant amount of, of, of the liabilities that is there. So the incremental amount of investment that is coming is not showing up, will not show up on balance sheets going into even 2017 and 2018. And once you've got your costs and your balance sheet balance sheets under control, I think then you're geared up for the next round of growth. So my sense is we're still in a consolidation phase. Uh, your financial system is going through a large consolidation phase. Corporate India started its consolidation last year, or probably to even 2015, some of these companies started off with. So we've hit the bottom and we've actually bounced incrementally back. But I'm, I don't think we're, we're some time away before we see mid-teen earnings again in corporate India. Mr. Andrade, uh, good morning. This is uh, Anandio from the Delhi studio. Um, I just want to rewind a little bit and I want to uh, del dip into 15 years of experience that you have as a fund manager. What we've seen in the last two, three years or even longer, let's say five-year period, do you remember from your own fund managing experience a similar pattern that would have happened earlier? Oh yeah, these things happen quite often uh, and uh, what happened in the last five years uh, is you got a uh, you got a brilliant valuation opportunity somewhere in 2013. 
So if you're an investor in 2013, or late 2012, 2013, and even 2014, your returns would be definitely double digit. Of course, it may not have come from the index category or the top 50 companies because they, those are companies struggling with their own challenges. But if you had built a portfolio across the breadth of the market or even if you look at some of the large portfolios that exist in the market, your returns have been double digit or even, uh, or even closer, to, uh, closer to the high teen levels. So there's not been a challenge in terms of making, uh, uh, making, uh, making returns on the, in, in, in India equities. Uh, the challenge remains is how how can you turn this into a secular trend? So, like I said, India's the corporate environment is bottomed out. Um, it it is very similar to uh, to what happened in year 2000 to maybe year 2002. The only difference this time is that probably the international economy or the international environment is far more volatile than the that Indian. That's what I wanted to there. ask you because if I look at the last. Uh, bottom that we saw, let's say 2000, uh, probably around the time when you were starting as a fund manager. And uh, since then, there was a major US-led rec recovery post-2001. And it uh, was driven by easy money, um, the entire uh, the Greenspan, Bernanke uh, part that we saw, a significant armaments expo expenditure by the US government, which had multiplier effects um, across the world. And uh, you saw a major boom in the in India, which uh, some people say was a uh, was an outcome of what the previous NDA government, the Vajpayee government, had done, and the UPA government took forward. But essentially, it was the rise of finance, right? Because if you look at what led to the first round of growth from 2003 to 2008, we saw infrastructure driving it up. That seems to have disappeared now. Uh, well, there are many reasons why markets get created, okay, and um, uh, and if you go back to 2008, which has been the latter part of your observation, it was uh, it was the entire capex cycle across the world that drove it. If you go back to year 2000, it was the technology investment that actually drove it. Uh, this time around, we're still looking for anchors around what will what will drive drive the market, and that seems to be missing in the near term. But in the longer term, I think within the region, you will find. Um, a reasonable amount of opportunity that comes with with, with consumers and their and their ability to leverage and starting of a consumer cycle, whether it's in India or whether it's in uh, some of our larger uh, larger emerging markets around us. So we just have to give it some time. Uh, we'll have to let this liquidity digest itself. Markets markets and economies always come back to uh, uh, come back to mean. So even if we, have, we, we keep worrying about the international environment in terms of uh, high liquidity and interest rates tightening up, I do not have a call on it and I do not want to have a call on, on, on an event like this. But over a period of time, I think once you retrace that mean, um, um, India as, a, as an environment will be affected, but I think will be moderately affected by any, any volatility that's coming into, uh, in, into, finan in, into financial assets worldwide. Actually, so, so I, just, I, I was uh, being a little, I, I was trying to be a little more specific here and uh, let me just rephrase that question. I'm saying sure. that if I take a look at India and I know, I, I don't know whether you can uh, talk stocks uh, given your compliance requirements, but if I look at the GVKs, the Lankos, the GMRs, all of which actually rose dramatically driven by easy credit from the PSU banking sector and raising money from the markets as well. They got uh, big contracts, which they uh, ended up doing on very low equity base, right? Heavy debt, low equity. When you look at those balance sheets, then there are, there are a lot of holes in, I'm not uh, talking about these three companies, but there are many holes in various companies which came up at that time, got massive valuations. We are, it was a growth driven by a credit bubble, which has collapsed. Now, I understand you're saying that there are structural changes and 2016-17 is going to be the cleaning up of that credit period. But 5 lakh crores still of stressed assets on a conservative demand basis in the power sector, out of which probably right now not even 1 lakh crore has been cleaned up. Do you really believe that it will just take one or two years for that to get okay? Well, there's been no fresh uh, lending to any of these uh, projects since year 2012, or maybe even a little earlier than that. So what the system seems to be dealing with is all the assets that have been created before that. 
and while we have uh, and while we are looking at it from a uh, extremely near in, in uh, from 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 a very recent event point of view if i take you back to the 90s you had very large steel companies that actually went under yeah. okay and uh, what led to the credit crisis with the with the same set of companies which is uh, public sector banks in in that period was industry like textiles um, some part of sugar processing and uh, and 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 metals all those companies well, the only different was capacity. that the government came in and nationalized those took over that debt Uh, kind of uh, gave a bailout no, to all those companies, right? The entire textile sector gained they from didn't. that. No, nobody, nobody, nobody got nationalized. No, uh, a lot the of the government bailed out the, the entire textile sector in the eighties. The long uh, textile no, mills no, were no. allowed to sell their assets, were ho- allowed to hold on to their assets. They really didn't have to do anything about it. I'm saying today the valuation of the assets itself is under question. I think cycle is very much the same. Um, I am not too sure if the government stepped in in the 90s to bail out most of those companies. No, I'm talking about okay, 80s. Okay, but those companies went bankrupt, yeah. and they did sell assets on the ground. I agree with that part. Uh, the NPA cycle in uh, in uh, the turn of the century went almost to 12 percent. Okay, which is very similar to what the uh, environment is like today. of course the size of the problem in terms of absolute value is larger uh, but in con- in terms of context and percentages they work out the same mm. and you've just gotten down to restructuring probably last year mm. uh, this year you've seen a number of companies put up their assets for sale mm. i'm sure you'll find a way to uh, to restructure a large part of these assets mm. and uh, we will uh, we will build the financial system all over again with a completely new participants i think it's an industry cycle you are going through you got optimism that was built on top and you got pessimism again, which is just again i, I just want to be again to get your views to, uh, because you know there are a lot of these con- uh, the confusion there's a lot of uh, uh, cross talk about it let me look at the assets which are getting restructured sold so you have cement you have power which is already operating but a large part of the debt in power for instance is of capacities which have no power purchase agreements have never produced a single unit of power till now and there are scbs which will never buy at the rate at which it becomes uh, profitable so if i have a jsw energy buying a jp ventures uh, power company today it has a plant load factor which is at least 65% currently right it has a power purchase agreement with Ma- madhya pradesh it does sell uh, uh, merchant power currently t- so uh, approximately 80% of what it produces is sold if i look at the cement companies where we are seeing uh, assets being sold uh, whether it's a uh, wholesale which sells for its uh, international operations these are productive capacities that is my question again J- just for the viewers if you could explain how far is the existing assets how far can they really be sold to restructure debt okay uh, so let's quantify these numbers okay uh, uh, 1 megawatt of power capacity takes about 6 crores to put up yeah. assuming that is in some semi finished state of of con- construction mm-hmm. to make it operational the number will go up to about 8 crores okay uh, on 8 crores I'm I'm not too sure if raw material is really a problem at this point in time but assuming that you solve your raw material problems and start generating power you will re- you you will be able to uh, you will be able to earn a return on capital employed which is closer to about 9 or 10% say worst case okay uh, so if you return if you earn a return on uh, on capital of between uh, 9 and 10% and your cost of debt is between 9 and 10% you are servicing your debt obligation The question here is, what is it in it for the equity shareholder? Nothing. Okay, which is largely represented of the fact that equity as a percentage of the entire enterprise value of some of these names that you put out yeah, exactly. is virtually negligible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, negligible. Mm-hmm. So what we trying, uh, what we what what we need to also uh, put into context here is that the. asset which is on the ground is not equivalent to a pricing of zero even if it is non operational there is a salvage value for it and if you complete the power plant even a power plant or the operational asset even at a higher cost okay you will earn a lower cost return on 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 your capital employed okay 
and the first uh, hit that uh, that any any fund uh, any financer would have to take will be the equity guys before it goes on to the uh, uh, fixed income or the, uh, the the banking sector and even if the banking sector does have to take a haircut you you will have to take a haircut of probably 10% 20% of the entire project cost and make it viable so i'm just coming from the context that you haven't seen a new problem that has been funded after 2012 which is surfacing now my question okay. then the, my next question so to you would be it's not such a big deal sorry completely sorry please go ahead yes so go, go ahead go ahead no my next question would obviously then be that uh, are these companies overvalued i mean if i look at some of those companies they, and uh, for some reason ever since we've seen that the markets recover and go up people are looking for stocks which they just look at the multiples and see if the multiple is low let's buy it and they're buying it and they're all gone up 20 30% and uh, to me they look like they've become expensive suddenly i don't think that's the way you need to look at it if a stock falls 95% from the top and goes up 30% from the bottom it's it's quite meaningless to even look at that number no but if i look at some of those real estate companies for instance uh some of them have uh, managed to retire debt have become uh, like dlf announced that it's even doing some bit of capital infusion fusion there um but you know the way in which the valuation was originally done was done on the basis of land bank and in the heady days of 2007 you, you uh, analysts uh, were looking for excuses to give value to every company you would say the sum of parts d merger this that land bank and you could find anything that valuation of course is completely gone but i'm saying is it entirely done you think that all of it has been completely um, factored in by the markets in the last 5 6 years i don't think markets factored in 100% of what is expected all right okay a lot a lot is 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 also dependent upon how the company is really executing so if you show financial discipline if you've been able to manage your balance sheet well uh, market rewards you longer term so i i honestly wouldn't look at what's happened in the last one year to say that uh, uh, companies are overvalued or undervalued and i just go back to the beginning of uh, beginning of uh, uh, this conversation that and i say equity markets today are are, are hitting all time highs not not in india but it's been across the world so markets been equity as an asset class has been quite resilient and uh, it it could one of the biggest reasons being identified is the surplus liquidity that's there in the system okay it does liquidity does loss her, loss around and finds its way into uh, is it in, the new normal in, in, is that the new normal is p assets. expansion the new normal with the given liquidity is I, is equity is going to be that. the only asset which gives you returns in the let's say at least in the medium term look i am uh, i'm i'm an investor who looks at cash flows anything that drives cash flows uh, i'm willing to pay up a price and i'm not willing to pay up a a a, a, a disproportionate amount of money for uh, for for free cash flows okay so if uh if some part of the market doesn't make sense to me and those businesses are not solvent uh i would step back and i would not even try to identify with what's happening out there so give me a good business and there are many of and there are plenty of them uh who 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 have who are running a business through efficient capital um the companies which are uh, which are large in their sector and uh, and if i find it ask, does your compliance allow you to name stocks because i i don't uh, want to miss the chance of i mean if you look at the parameters i don't want to miss the chance for our viewers to get stock ideas from you if it's possible uh, i mean i don't think that helps in neither the near term or the long term because it doesn't uh, i mean it doesn't help an expert like you but let me tell you viewers works. who can't do the analysis of the kind that you do or have the experience they will definitely gain if you can give them some stocks and obviously with the with so the disclaimer that is, this is not a uh, this is not some guaranteed growth but your ideas the ideas where the way in which you see things developing long term just give us some names and why you think they will do well 
I mean, I, 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 again, uh, I'll, I'll step away from the names right now, but I just the say that any company that's handling financial risk or having too much of debt on their books, mm. I'd completely avoid those companies uh, in putting them into the portfolio. I think the strategy is very simple. Look for a business, look for a franchise that will su- that'll survive into the next decade. Mm. Look at a management that's got financial discipline. Mm. Okay, uh, you'll, you'll have a portfolio which is extremely great over the next couple okay, of years. Okay, number one, avoid companies which don't have financial discipline, probably don't have good interest coverage ratio, and uh, probably have very high debt but don't really have a plan to work. Okay, that's the number one advice from Kenneth Andrade. Number two, what are you going to do in terms of the current economic scenario? Well, I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an equity investor, so I continue to look for opportunities that exist at every part of the market cycle. And uh, usually opportunities come in when the environment and the news is extremely bad. Yeah. So, okay, IT, so we're just looking at, at IT finding... IT services, very bad news in the <laughs> last three, four days. What would you do there? Well, when you have large mature companies trading at these valuations, uh, it, it, it definitely warrants a look at what's happening out there in the sector. And uh, when, you do get, uh, when you do get news which is a little negative uh, or largely negative in, uh, across the entire industry, you would also have uh, valuations follow the same path. So you look to, look to see where the, uh, where the bottom gets made in some of these larger names and uh, align with them. All right, I was... Uh uh, reading up on, on an interview that you did recently and you were saying that you see structural changes in consumption and especially with wage growth. Now, um, you know, if one looks at wage growth, I'm assuming you're also talking of one is the pay commission, of course, the seventh pay commission. Uh, it's not turned out to be as much of a bonanza as people thought. Even the, I think even the arrears are not going to be paid this month. They'll come in August. Some of those allowances are going to be actually given over four quarters. Um, that is, uh, therefore, a limited uh, impetus. Then there, is, uh, there was an estimate that there'll be a 10% growth at the beginning of the year, 10% growth in wages this year. Overall, in the corporate sector, startups, etc., will give about 20%. And then we saw uh, some of the big startup names, actually, saying that we can't hire. We'll take you in December. You know? And... Uh, that was a bit of a dampener, wasn't it? Uh, when you're looking at one faction of the market, I mean, the other faction of the market is where uh, where a lot of structural changes have happened, and these are all policy initiatives that have taken place. It also accounts for 60% of the total population in India, and uh, I think that will be the moving part in the next couple of years. Uh, uh, rural India, uh, at least from from. At least from the government of India context, uh, they want farm incomes to double by 2022. Um, and it is more to do uh, with, uh, without, without increasing uh, minimum support prices. Okay. Um, and if you've been able to implement, uh, implement what they've started out to do with the farm insurance scheme, uh, the crop insurance scheme, and implement it across the, uh, across the country, you effectively remove cyclicality from the monsoons. Okay, so once you stabilize cash flows on the ground, uh, I think you you got a huge momentum in, uh, or you have huge confidence in um, in in consumers in that in that part of the that part of the country, and that accounts for a bulk of your uh, population, and it's actually the bottom end of uh, of the of the uh, population pyramid in India. And so if that the consumption momentum, basket of that part. That. Uh, Mr. Andrade, if I look at the consumption basket of that part, whether it is final consumption or whether it is productive consumption in terms of tractors and things like that, what would you pick out as the things to watch out for? I'd go straight for the productive part of that economy. All right, which is essentially the agro, uh, maybe tractors and things like that, uh, insecticides, uh, pesticides. I mean, when industry gets cash flows, they increase in product. They invest in productivity. Uh, when cash flows come to any part of the industry, which here we're talking about the agrarian part of the world, um, I, my sense is that they first invest in higher productivity uh, and higher incomes, and then they uh, and then they take it to discretionary consumption. So that's the path I will follow. Okay, don't name na- uh, names, but at least give us some subsectors. Whether it's seeds, whether it is. You know, pesticides. What are you looking at? Tractors. Which is the space where you think there is decent valuation at the moment? 
actually it cuts across the chain you can look at financial services because they have a very large role to play in it uh, it cuts across agri agricultural input so you can break it up into seeds uh, agro agrochemicals as well as uh, fertilizers then you can look at the mechanization part of it all but that's going to be critical uh, as it uh, as it builds on uh, wage inflation because you have to mechanize your farm uh, you have to uh, put significant amount of farm inputs or invest in farm inputs for higher productivity so i think uh, it's not a very small segment to look at it and it is a multi billion dollar opportunity which is out there um, it's uh, 17 or it's almost 16% of india's gdp uh, comes from agriculture 60% um, of the population lives on cash flows from that 16% of uh, of of Mm. of cash flows if i look at the uh, microfinance institutions with the uh, rural play some of the housing uh, non bank housing companies and stuff like that uh, are you happy with the valuations with there i mean what are valuations here i mean you're looking at three times uh, price to book and uh, that might look expensive for a company which has just been uh, been in operation for the last four or five maybe six years uh, if if this company has been able to double its uh, double its uh, uh, lending book, which most of these companies talk about into the next two years, um, uh, you probably need to recompute your book value as to where it will stand after two years. Uh, the second big element about these companies, and a lot of them have gotten licenses and will become small finance banks going into the next couple of months. Uh, sorry, next couple of years. Um, and you not even put in, uh, uh, a, and you're not even looking at what the uh, what the liability side could mean for some of these companies out there. So I think uh, uh, we we'll need to look at each of these opportunities holistically before uh, uh, sitting on the judgment seat whether they are expensive or whether they're cheap. I'm sure some of these guys are ex extremely well managed, uh, and some of them have processes, and some of them have the vision to uh, to to build build organizations out there. Uh, so I I just go out there and make sure that I can pick uh, a company that executes well, rather than worry about whether uh, yeah, it is uh, it is expensive and I will not make money near term. I, I just buy a good company which is there. So I think the focus ne necessarily needs to be identify a business that lasts into the next decade, someone who is uh, very efficient in the use of capital. I think you will be okay. Uh, it doesn't matter which industry they come from. Right. Um, Urban demand, do you think that it's uh, kind of saturated? Uh, you, you're seeing elements of, uh, I mean, you're seeing some parts of the market which are doing well in urban demand also. So I'm, I, I don't think it's going to be impacted as dramatically as, uh, uh, as what the numbers suggest in the first quarter at least. All right. Uh, one final question, Mr. Andrade, and then uh, we, I know you've given us a lot of time, but uh, um, it's you know, news driven right now, and that is uh, the telecom sector. We saw these price cuts yesterday, major price cuts from the existing players, Reliance Geo coming in probably by the end of the year. Is this a space that an investor should get in at all? I mean, it's a great thing to use the phone and run your computer, but should you put your money in there? I'd wait and watch to see how it evolves itself. There's a lot of balance sheet that's been put behind these businesses just now. Uh, I wouldn't want to preempt it uh, all right now. Uh, it's a fairly large industry that is sitting out there, uh, and there are very large players with a very large balance sheet in in that segment. So I'd rather wait and watch rather than preempt and uh, and try to put money to work in that industry. All right, uh, Kenneth Andrade, thank you so much uh, for speaking to us and taking our time. It's been really uh, great talking to you, and we've learned a lot today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, and you didn't take any names. I tried my best, but you didn't. So I am, uh, there's no disclosure to <laughs> give either. Thank you so much.